as at November 2019, there are more than 178,000 refugees that are registered with the UNHCR in Malaysia. Out of this, 80% are from Myanmar. 26% are children below the age of 18. As you all already know, the Malaysian government does not legally allow refugees to work or their children to go to school while waiting for resettlement. So, how do you think they live their lives or rebuild their lives in a foreign land? Today, we have invited two very outstanding children from the refugee community to share with us about their lives, their dreams, and their hopes as displaced persons in a foreign land. Our first speaker is Jabir. Jabir was only 13 when his mother took him and his siblings on a long and dangerous journey from Myanmar to escape the difficult life there. Let us now listen to the story of Jabir. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm J Muhammad Jabir from Mema, originally Rohingya. I got two lives in Mema, one life in Malaysia, one life. I think most of the people know that Rohingya people cannot go to a school in Mema, cannot walk. My father decided to come to Malaysia to give us a better life. Once he settled down in Malaysia, at Selayang. After a few years, he want us to bring from Mema, but he cannot afford to bring us because not enough money. My mom decided to leave the hometown to the Malaysia. Then my mom took one boat with other people who is coming to Malaysia. The boat took 300 people. If we want to sleep, we just lay on each other. Cannot sleep, uh, no place enough. And we only get one meal and drinks like 200 milliliter per day. Then after 10 days, we arrived to the Thailand, one mountainous area. Then the boats drop us there. After five days, we start, start to walk the long, uh, dangerous journey, very darkness from the mountains. Then we start to walk, the whole night we walk, the Thailand. Then we reach to the one of the point. We rest there for a few hours, like three hours. Then night, we start again to walk in the darkness. And I was very tired. And also I got younger brothers and sisters, and I need to carry them. And I feel very tired, and I was talking uh, to my mom. Mom, I cannot walk anymore, and also I need to carry my youngest. How can I walk? And everyone crying, and me too. However, we keep continue walking. Then we reach one of the point again. Then we took food, and we take rest for a few hours. Then one of the car came to, to take us. The car is just like a uh, wheeler size, very small, but the, the car took 10 people. How are you gonna sit there? So there is no chairs. Only for drivers go one chair. Then the 10 people just fled. No, they cannot head up because if the police saw, saw us, mean, we will get cash, right? Then the driver uh, drive the car for nine hours, then he dropped us to one home. Then we are, now we are preparing to rest. Then around two o'clock p.m., the surrounding of the people of that area complained to the police because in that home, a lot of people making noise. When the police came and caught us, then they bring to the balai then they shaking us, where are you from? Why you don't have anything, any document? How you, how you all came here? Then finally we settled that we are Rohingya, refugee. 
under 18, they sent to the campsite, under uh, over 18, they sent to the jail in prison. After two months, the UNHCR went to campsite and interview us whether we are Rohingya or not. Then after the interview, they helped us to release from the campsite and meet my father. And once when we saw our father, I was very sad because my father working hard here and he, he looked very old already. And I am still young, I cannot help my father. And, and also we was very happy, the family, because we all met together, including my father. My, my dad want to send us to a school, but not able to go to school because it's already open. I was waiting for one year. Then that year, I helped my father at the restaurant. And I also got chance to learn Malay speaking. The next year, my father helped us to register to the school. Then I, I start a school in primary one, but by age of 15. Can you imagine if, I, if I, my age is 15, in I, I am primary one, what the classmate will think. But I, I keep encourage myself to study. Then I start from primary one. Then the teachers, all the teachers came to me and talked to me. They are supporting me to study. Because I'm not able to write, not able to read. I cannot do anything because I didn't study in Myanmar. I try my best in semester one and semester two. I finish primary one, then the teacher sent me to primary two. In one year, I finished primary one and primary two. And second year of the school, I attend to primary three. In 2017, I will attend for primary four. So now I'm able to read and can speak Malay, but not very well in English. And the teachers worrying about me because the coming year, I cannot study anymore in, the, in primary school. I'm going to uh, 17 years old. Then they send me to the English tuition class. Then the, once I study English tuition class, the teachers imp, uh, report to a school teacher that I improved in English. Then the teachers was very happy on me that I'm trying my best and also they are supporting me, encourage me. Then the teachers found a, a special program which is a set attend for advanced secondary employability training under diploma. So this level, very high level for me, then one when I start, when I go to class, wh what the teachers talk, teaching, talking to me, I'm not able to understand to them. Because this high level subject, so I cannot understand at all. After semester one, I, f I feel all the subject, and the teachers came to me and talk to me, and I let them know all my situation, and my, how I came here, what I studied before. Then the, after they understand me, they trying to help me, how can I improve? I am able to pass the second semester, I passed three subjects. Then the teachers keep support me, encourage me and I support myself. I try my best. And third semester and fourth semester, I pass all the subjects. <laughs> Everyone will think that I spend my time a lot of, right? Then only I, I'm able to pass my subject, right? But I'm not the person I spend a lot of time. So here is the a schedule, you can see. So 6.30 a.m. to 8 
a.m., I go, I take transport to go to school. So during the transport, in the bus, I, do, I try to do my homework. But I feel sleepy because tonight I never enough sleep. So from 8 a.m. to 30, uh, 3, 30 p.m., I study in a school. And 3.30 p.m. to 4.45 p.m., I do volunteering service hours. Why should I do this? I, do, I need to do this. Because I do, I, they, the school give me a lot of scholarship because my father cannot afford to pay monthly fees and school transportation all. So the, the school give me a scholarship. So I need to spend time in a school to help. Then from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., I go to the wet, wet market because to make my pocket money. My, as well, my father cannot pay, right? So I need to make my own pocket money to buy books, pants, all, and to for my own expenses. After 10 p.m., I think, Every people go to sleep, right? But not me. I'm not the person who go to sleep by 10 p.m. After 10 p.m. to 1 a.m., I help my father to prepare the ingredients for the next day to run the business. Then I go to eat dinner, then I go to bed. What I want to say especially, I like to thanks to my parents, especially to, the Malaysia, to Malaysia and Sushi. Why I like to thanks to Malaysia? The Malaysia give me a big opportunities to go to a school. I really appreciate full to Malaysia for this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to Jabir for letting us have an insight into the lives of the refugee community, especially its children. And now we would like to move on to our next speaker. The word sacrifice, what does it mean to you? It means giving up something for the sake of others' consideration. Our next guest, who is a top student from the Unity Refugee Education Centre, since arriving in Malaysia at the age of five years old, she has had to go through and endure many challenges in life. First, the death of her father. Next, the abandonment of her stepfather. And then, when her uncle, who was the main breadwinner for their family, left to resettle in the United States, her family had to fend for themselves. Everyone had to sacrifice in order to keep their family together and afloat in weathering all the storms that pass through their lives. May we now invite Noor Begum to share with us her story about sacrifice. Um, selamat petang, uh, tuan-tuan dan puan-puan. Um, ini family saya. Um, saya mempunyai lima orang adik-beradik. Okay. Uh, ini gambar pakcik saya. Uh, sebelum dia pergi ke US, dia lah yang tanggung makan minum keluarga kami, so pemakaian keluarga kami. Lepas dia pergi ke US, um, mak saya terpaksa cari kerja untuk tanggung keluarga kami. Jadi sewaktu dia cari kerja, banyak kerja cari tapi tak dapat. Tapi finally dia jumpa satu kerja tapi dengan gaji yang murah. Macam uh, gaji dia 800 sebab mak terdesak, mak pun terpaksa ambil kerja tu. Jadi lepas mak ambil kerja tu, mak kena bayar 300 ringgit untuk sewa rumah, mak lagi 500 tu mak kena spend on apa adik-adik makan minum, apa bil api, bil air. Tapi uh, yang the rest of the money tu mak 
mak mak ada untuk tanggung satu orang anak belajar aja. Jadi mak saya decide waktu tu nak kasih apa anak paling besar belajar which is my sister. Lepas tu kakak saya pun dia start pergi sekolah, dia start dengan primary. Masa dia belajar primary tu dia selalu belajar macam hari-hari biasa, balik buat kerja sekolah. Lepas tu kalau malam-malam kalau dia buat kerja sekolah, saya selalu pergi kat dia. Macam dia belajar apa, dia bagi tahu kat saya. Saya pun ikut belajar dengan dia. Macam catch saya boleh catch up lah cepat-cepat. Kadang-kadang masa dia buat revision, dia lupa saya tengah duduk situ, saya sendiri aja dia balik. So kakak saya cakap, oh um, saya ni ada potensial untuk um, dalam pembelajaran. Jadi kakak saya dia nak dia, dia nak sacrifice dia punya peluang, dia nak bagi saya opportunity untuk belajar. Lepas tu saya grab opportunity tu untuk belajar. Walaupun kalau saya jadi dia, saya takkan buat macam tu. Saya nak future saya lagi brighter. Tapi untuk adik-adik, dia sanggup sacrifice dia punya peluang, dia punya opportunity untuk belajar. Dia bagi dekat saya, dia cakap, kau belajar, kau ambil peluang ni. Kau tak perlu buat apa-apa, kau bayar balik dengan belajar rajin-rajin dengan kakak. So kakak saya, mak saya sebab mak saya bagi kerja, kakak saya dia jaga dua orang adik-beradik saya. Um, dia bagi dia kemas rumah. Bukan macam anak-anak pun anak-anak teenager lain. Lain kalau dia orang pergi sekolah, dia orang have fun dengan dia orang punya kawan-kawan. Tapi kakak saya dia kat rumah kena jaga apa adik macam macam seorang ibu. Dia kena buat semua kerja rumah. So saya sangat terima kasih kepada kakak sebab bagi peluang kat saya untuk belajar. Jadi saya ambil opportunity saya belajar rajin-rajin. Saya Belajar sampai saya dapat markah yang bagus dalam exam. Uh, ini nenek saya. Uh, nenek saya dia menghidap penyakit kanser. So kalau lepas balik sekolah saya akan jaga nenek saya, tolong-tolong nenek saya. Tapi satu hari itu nenek saya kena admit ke hospital sebab dia punya penyakit kanser tu. Lepas uh, few day dia kena keluar, dia doktor suruh kasih dia keluar balik dari hospital tu. Dia balik rumah dia tanya saya dia cakap begam duduk sini nenek nak tanya. Kalau saya cakap, kenapa nak? Nak cakap, bila besar kau nak jadi apa? Kau dah decide ke belum? So saya cakap, ambition saya, saya belum decide lagi. Terus nenek cakap, nenek nak bila besar nanti kau jadi doktor. Terus saya cakap, kenapa nenek nak saya jadi doktor? Nenek cakap, nenek nampak dekat hospital, banyak doktor macam yang doktor yang jaga orang tua tu semua. Dan nampak dia orang penat, kadang-kadang dia orang fed up nak apa tu, jaga patient tu semua. Jadi, dia nenek cakap nenek nak kau jadi doktor besar nanti kau kalau jadi doktor kau jaga patient tu baik-baik jangan macam kalau kau penat pun kau layan dia orang so saya pun ambil kata-kata nenek dalam hati saya pelajar rajin-rajin saya dengar cikgu cakap kalau nak jadi doktor um, kena dapat apa markah yang bagus kena belajar dalam lama belajar rajin-rajin jadi saya pun ikutlah macam apa cikgu cakap saya belajar rajin-rajin dapat supaya dapat markah bagus So masa uh, saya belajar-belajar sebelum sementara saya tengah belajar tu mak saya selalu cakap um, kau tak boleh continue kau punya secondary school. Saya kan mak tengah main. So saya pun tak ambil beratlah sangat pasal apa yang mak cakap. Tapi one day masa saya punya ni gambar graduation saya, hari saya graduate, malam tu macam saya dapat banyak present, saya dapat top saya jadi top student dekat Unity. Saya belajar bagus-bagus untuk masuk secondary. Malam mak cakap Masa duduk makan lepas dinner, Mak cakap, kau dah tak boleh sambung kau punya belajar kat secondary school. Baru saya realise yang Mak selama ni dia tak main-main. Dia serius yang dia cakap, saya tak boleh masuk secondary school. Lepas tu saya pun rasa sedih lah. Nangis pun ada sebab selama ni saya belajar rajin-rajin, saya dapat good mark. Tapi at last macam saya punya effort tu waste. Lepas tu sebelum, sebelum graduation ni, Masa macam tengah belajar kat sekolah tu, ada satu hari tu cikgu sekolah saya dia pernah tanya kat saya. Dia tanya, ah dia kan kat saya je kat semua orang. dia cakap family siapa yang ada problem datang kat depan bagi tahu cikgu semua. So saya pun saya pun raise up my hand, saya bagi tahu kat cikgu, ah family saya ada problem-problem macam ni. So cikgu pun mungkin cikgu bagi tahu waktu tu cikgu tak cakap apa-apa, cikgu bagi tahu kat suci semua yang family ni ada macam ni problem. So next year macam tu kat Januari, saya graduate kat November. So Januari next year, um, Suci panggil semua ibu bapa yang yang student yang nak pergi secondary tu panggil gather, lepas tu dia bagi tahu good news. 80%, 80% apa daripada school fees tu Suci bayar 80%. So kita kena bayar 20% school fees lah. 
So uh, and then transport fees tu pun 50% cuci bayar, kita bayar lagi 50% je. So mak saya mendapat tahu berita ni, mak saya pun gembira, mak saya dia bagi saya peluang untuk belajar. Dia cakap kau boleh sambung belajar kalau kau nak belajar. Mak saya cakap sebab kau dah, dah, dah ada apa dah bagi peluang kat kau, kau grab peluang ni, kau belajar aja aja. Jadi saya pun belajar aja aja uh, macam untuk capai goal saya nak jadi doktor. Tapi makin lama makin lama saya belajar belajar belajar. Saya realise yang nak jadi doktor ni bukan senang. Dia ambil waktu masa yang lama sangat. So kalau macam tu saya pun fikir kalau nak jadi doktor ambil waktu yang masa yang lama. Macam mana saya nak jadi mak saya kena kerja lama-lama lagi lah. So saya tak nak mak saya kerja lama-lama. Jadi saya pun um, decide saya cakap oh saya nak lepas habis belajar saya nak kerja yang tak nak jadi doktor dah. Saya nak kerja yang macam senang dan bagus-bagus. Lepas tu uh, uh, kerja untuk mak supaya mak tak payah kerja lagi. Nak bagi peluang ke adik-adik kecil saya untuk belajar. Lepas tu saya belajar rajin-rajin lah sekarang setiap kali sebab saya kena dapat A masa dapat Kalau exam kau saya kena dapat A, kalau tak kalau tak dapat A mak marah, mak cakap Even though saya dapat A dekat subjek punya test, saya tak dapat A dekat like, physical education ke art ke Mak cakap kau tak pandai, kalau saya dapat B dekat physical education pun mak cakap apa ni B Mak dapat B satu je kat report card, mak dah marah So saya kena macam kena berusaha dapat A lah. Saya dapat A setiap kali saya setiap kali mak nampak macam full A kalau mak gembira sangat. Kalau ada semua A, satu B, mak dah marah. So saya pun macam belajar aja ajin, dapat try to get A dan saya ada nasihat untuk kawan-kawan kat luar sana, kekayaan tu eh, dia sebentar aja. Kita tak tahu kat future kita kaya ke tak. So kita kena belajar dari sekarang so that kita punya future terjamin. Kita ada brighter future. Dan kawan-kawan dekat Unity tu, kawan-kawan saya, saya nak bagi tahu yang sementara ada orang support untuk kita belajar, even though orang tu dengan kita bukan blood related, dia nak juga kita belajar, dia nak juga future kita brighter. Walaupun kita ni bukan apa-apa dengan suci semua, dia tetap nak tolong kita. So kau grab opportunity ni, kau belajar untuk diri sendiri belajar uh, belajar rajin so uh, future kita bright dan buat suci bangga so terima kasih Thank you very much to Jabir and Nur Begum The story of these two amazing children are truly inspirational to all of us Although Tsuji and other NGOs are doing the little that we can to help these children, we hope that they will maintain their fighting spirit and their determination to continue learning as they step out into the society next time. So, once again, we would like to thank Jabir and Nur Begum for sharing their life stories. <laughs>